This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 19. Coming up on Space Time. The strange dense structure discovered below the South Atlantic anomaly. The new gravity mission to monitor climate change. And the creation of a new exotic state of matter. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A strange dense structure has been discovered directly below the South Atlantic anomaly and just above the Earth's core mantle boundary. The object, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, may provide important clues about Earth's magnetic field and when it's next likely to reverse polarity. The Earth's magnetic field is generated by the planet's liquid iron outer core, which is kept in motion flowing around the planet's solid iron and nickel inner core by the planet's rotation. This geodynamo generates a magnetic field which surrounds the Earth. It not only dictates where the compass needles point north or south, but also protects the planet from harmful radiation from space. Over the last 20 million years, Earth has settled into a pattern of pole polarity reversals roughly every 200,000 to 300,000 years. These reversals cause the polarity of the planet's magnetic north and south poles to flip. However, there hasn't been a pole reversal for more than 780,000 years, and scientists aren't sure why. The first signs of what could be the beginnings of a planetary pole reversal is the so-called South Atlantic Anomaly, a region off the coast of Argentina which has strong North Pole polarity. As well as affecting compass readings on Earth, the South Atlantic Anomaly is also a danger area for spacecraft, with the inner Van Allen radiation belt dipping down to within just 200 kilometres of the Earth's surface right above this area. This leads to an increased flux of energetic particles in this region, exposing spacecraft to higher than usual levels of radiation caused by the trapped protons in the inner Van Allen belt. The problem's considered so important that the International Space Station requires extra shielding in order to deal with it, and the Hubble Space Telescope does not take observations while passing through the South Atlantic anomaly. Astronauts are also affected by this region. It causes peculiar shooting stars to be seen in the visual field of astronauts, an effect caused by cosmic rays shooting through astronauts' eyeballs. The South Atlantic anomaly is also blamed for the early failures of the Global Star Network satellites and the destruction of Japan's Earth-orbiting Hitomi X-ray Space Telescope. And it doesn't end there. NASA's reported that laptops have crashed as space shuttle flights pass through the anomaly and in October 2012, the SpaceX CRS-1 Dragon cargo ship, which was docked to the International Space Station at the time, experienced a sudden transient problem just as it passed over the anomaly. While passing through the South Atlantic anomaly, the Pamela experiment detected antiproton levels that were orders of magnitude higher than expected, a finding that suggests that the Van Allen belts can find antimatter particles produced by the interaction of Earth's upper atmosphere with cosmic rays. Now, scientists have gathered new data from sites in southern Africa, which extends their records of Earth's magnetic field back thousands of years to the first millennium. The observations provide historical context to help explain recent ongoing changes in the South Atlantic anomaly. The study's lead author, Vincent Hare, from the University of Rochester, says while scientists have known for quite some time now that the magnetic field has been changing, they didn't know if it was unusual for this region on a longer time scale or whether it was normal for the area. The new data also provides evidence that a region below southern Africa may play a unique role in magnetic pole reversals. You see, scientists are getting strong evidence that there's something unusual about the core mantle boundary under this part of Africa that could be having an important impact on the global magnetic field. For the past 160 years, the strength of the magnetic field has been decreasing at an alarming rate. And the region where it's the weakest and continues to weaken just happens to be along the South Atlantic anomaly, stretching from Chile through Argentina, across the Atlantic Ocean, into Namibia and onto Zimbabwe. In order to put these relatively recent changes into historical perspective, the authors gathered data from sites in southern Africa within the South Atlantic Anomaly to compile a record of Earth's magnetic field strength over many centuries. Data collected previously, together with theoretical models, suggest that the core region beneath southern Africa may be the birthplace of recent and future pole reversals. 
The authors discovered that the magnetic field in this region fluctuated from the years 400 to 450, 700 to 750, and again from 1225 to 1550. The South Atlantic anomaly, therefore, is simply the most recent display of a recurring phenomenon within the Earth's core beneath Africa that eventually affects the entire planet. Researchers were able to gather their magnetic data for the project from an unlikely source, ancient clay remnants from southern Africa dating back to the early and late Iron Ages. The authors, working together with archaeologists, excavated clay samples from a site in the Lapopo River Valley, which borders Zimbabwe, South Africa and Botswana. You see, during the Iron Age in southern Africa, around the time of the first millennium, there was a group of Bantu-speaking people who cultivated grains and lived in villages composed of grain bins, huts and cattle enclosures. During periods of drought, they'd perform elaborate ritual cleansings of the villages by burning down the huts and grain bins. And the thing is, when you burn clay at very high temperatures, you stabilise the magnetic minerals in it, so that when they cool from these very high temperatures, they lock in a record of the Earth's magnetic field at that time. So the researchers excavated the samples, recorded their orientation in the field, and then brought them back to the lab to conduct measurements using magnetometers. In this way, they were able to use the samples to compile a record of Earth's magnetic field in the past. Meanwhile, seismological data has revealed a dense region deep beneath southern Africa, which has been dubbed the African Large Low Shear Velocity Province. The region is located right above the boundary between the hot liquid outer core of the planet and the stiffer, cooler mantle. Sitting on top of the liquid outer core, it may sink slightly, disturbing the flow of iron and ultimately affecting Earth's magnetic field. However, as similar events have happened before without polarity flips, the new data isn't pointing at a complete pole reversal anytime soon. It still doesn't explain, however, why the poles haven't reversed over such a long time. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's next Earth gravity mission is slated to launch aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on April 14. The Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment Follow-On Mission, or GRACE-FO, is a partnership between NASA and the German Research Center for Geosciences. The twin GRACE-FO spacecraft will continue the work of the original GRACE mission, which operated for some 15 years from March 2002 until October 2017. GRACE provided vital monitoring of how climate change caused by man's use of fossil fuels is affecting the planet. It observed major changes in the mass of the Antarctic ice sheet as the frozen continent shed some 125 gigatons of ice per year, causing global sea levels to rise by 0.35 millimetres annually. By the way, a gigaton of ice is a cubic kilometre-sized block of ice. Grace observations found even larger declines in the Greenland ice sheet, with a loss of approximately 280 gigatons of ice per year, causing global sea levels to rise by a further 0.8 millimetres annually. That's a total increase of 17.25 millimetres in 15 years. The two 580-kilogram Grace FO spacecraft will be placed into a 500-kilometre high low-Earth orbit. The pair will follow one another, some 220 kilometres apart, taking high-resolution microwave measurements of the distance between them. As they circle the Earth, areas of the planet with greater mass concentration will generate a slightly stronger gravitational pull. And this added gravity will affect the lead satellite first, pulling it away from the trailing satellite. Then, as the satellites continue, the trailing satellite will be pulled towards the lead satellite as it passes over the gravity anomaly. While this change in distance between the two spacecraft would appear imperceptible to you, the high-resolution microwave ranging system aboard the twin GRACE FO satellites will detect these minuscule changes in distance between them. Meanwhile, a highly accurate measuring device known as an accelerometer located at each satellite's centre of mass will measure any non-gravitational accelerations, such as those caused by atmospheric drag, so that only those accelerations caused by Earth's gravity are recorded. Global positioning system receivers will then determine the exact position of the satellites over the Earth to within less than a centimetre at the time of any gravitational perturbations. The data will allow scientists to generate consistently updated models of the Earth's gravitational field every 30 days, offering details of how mass, in most cases water, is moving around the planet. 
The distance between the spacecraft will also be measured experimentally using lasers as part of preparations for future generations of gravity research satellites. As well as a monthly gravity map, the probes will also create up to 200 profiles of temperature distribution and water vapour content in the atmosphere and ionosphere every day. To find out more about GRACE, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. The tracking of ice on Earth, Uh, what's this one all about? Yeah, this is um, a couple of missions that are being launched later this year, but they're both descendants of an earlier mission. The two GRACE spacecraft were in orbit around the Earth. They were very unusual. GRACE is an acronym for, if I remember rightly, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And what it was doing Doing. This pair of spacecraft, I think they were, they were in the same orbit around the Earth, but one of them was 200 kilometres in front of the other. But they had microwave links that meant that you could sense the distance between them to an accuracy of one thousandth of a millimetre. Wow. So they're 200 kilometres apart, but you know that distance with an accuracy of a thousandth of a millimetre. And what that means is that as they pass over areas of slightly higher and slightly lower gravitational pull on the Earth, the Earth's gravitational Gravity varies depending on where you are because it's more over the land than the ocean and things of that sort, very, very slightly. Nothing that you would ever perceive as a human. But to a sensitive experiment like GRACE, the distance between the two spacecraft changes slightly as you go over these concentrations of mass. So the first one gets a tug forward by the mass underneath it, which is not replicated until the second one catches up with it. So the the distance between them separates as you go over a mass concentration and then contracts again. And that is what the GRACE experiment was all about. It was incredibly successful and in particular was very, very successful at monitoring the reduction of the ice burden, the ice that covers the nation or the continent, subcontinent of Greenland. Uh, Greenland's ice is disappearing. Every year, Greenland loses about 280 billion tonnes of ice to the ocean every year. And that's due to climate change and global warming. That's lots of people putting ice in their drinks. Yeah, well, when you think of it in those terms, that's absolutely right. 20, 280 billion tonnes of ice. And of course, what that contributes to is the 3.4 millimetres per year rise in global sea levels. Mm. It's pushing the global sea level up. So, of course, this is such a hot topic in in geophysics, climate science, as well as space science, that that is why a follow-up spacecraft has been designed and will be launched this year. It's called GRACE Follow-On. So it's the same sort of thing, two spacecraft with microwave ranging to detect their separation. But this time, it's also going to have a downward-looking laser range finder. So what that means is that you can work out the height of the ice above the sort of sea level, and that allows you to make much more accurate calculations at any given point on the Earth's surface. That, that would be quite revealing, I imagine, because, uh, yeah, we, we think of uh, ice uh, melting, but uh, it has altitude as well, which um, yeah, would obviously right. reduce during a melt. That's right. So uh, it's all about, and actually this also links with the second one of these spacecraft. Uh, let me just talk about that briefly. It's now called ISAT-2. Uh, oh, which I follow- like that one. I mean, ISAT. As far as naming things goes, that's, that's, that's pretty good. It's a NASA spacecraft. It's following on from a European spacecraft, which is called Cryosat. Cryo just means cold. Yeah. Uh, Cryosat is a mission that's been in operation for quite some time. And what Cryosat does is sends radar pulses down to measure the height above sea level of an ice flow. So if you've got you know, a lump of ice and you, you can measure it's the height of the top of it above the sea level, then you know that it's nine times as deep below sea level Mm -hmm. as well, which gives you a measurement of the volume of the ice there. So it's all about working out how much sea ice there is. And so the ISAT-2 will actually do this job. So both GRACE follow-on and ISAT-2 will fly lasers, which will actually detect the height of the ice above the sea surface. So they're both going to return very interesting information and much more accurate estimates of these huge masses of ice that are being turned into ocean water every year. Yeah, 
and I would imagine that uh, they'd come back with their data pretty quickly. Yes, that's correct. Absolutely. You're not going to have to uh, wait long to find out how bad things really are. Yeah, in fact, in the world of science, when you've got real-time measurements going on, these measurements, you can't just read them off on a ruler or anything. They have to go through data processing in order to get the numbers you want out of the raw data. And what we do is, we do this in astronomy as well, we set up what's called a data pipeline. The idea is to automate the process as much as possible. So you put the raw data in at one end and you get the numbers you want out at the other. And data pipeline software is very complex. It engages many of our software engineers at the Australian Astronomical Observatory in order to make this work as well as possible. But it would be the same with the space missions. The pipelines would give you the data you want very quickly. Mm. ISAT 2 does have one other attribute that is quite remarkable. It's got a, a laser on board that essentially repeats at a frequency of 10 kilohertz. That's 10,000 times per second. And so that's the number of measurements you get as this thing flies above the ice. It's really a very remarkable piece of kit and will give us, I think, almost contour maps of the ice near the Earth's poles. I think it's something that we will follow with great interest when these missions take off. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The reason you're listening to Space Time is because you want to learn more. You want to increase your knowledge about the universe out there. That's why I know you'll love The Great Courses Plus now available in Australia and the UK, and of course the United States and Canada. With The Great Courses Plus, we have unlimited access to thousands of video and audio lectures, learning from the very best in their respective fields. In fact, you can improve your knowledge on just about anything that's of interest, history, physics, psychology, even how to play chess or take better pictures. There's no homework and no pressure of exams. The Great Courses Plus is lifelong learning at its best. Now, the course I've been checking out this week and suggest that you have a look at it too is Understanding the Universe, an Introduction to Astronomy. Presented by Alex Filipenko from the University of California, Berkeley, the course teaches you the basics of astronomy and then some. What impressed me was Professor Alex's teaching style. He obviously has a great passion for the subject, which is quite infectious. So here's a teacher who loves his subject matter, and I've got to tell you, I like the way he explains it. It's all very straightforward and easy to understand, but at the same time, it's also very comprehensive. And just as importantly, it's a visually stunning exploration of how the universe works. Everything from stellar explosions, black holes, neutron stars and galaxy evolution to the inner workings of technology, like the modern reflector optical telescope. And we have a special offer for space-time fans because we want you to start exploring the Great Courses Plus. So, for a limited time, you'll receive a special free month of unlimited access to all of the lectures. But you'll need to use our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. Start your special free one-month trial today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And, of course, I'll put the link in the show notes. Scientists have provided proof for a new exotic state of matter. The new state comprises an electron orbiting an atomic nucleus at such a great distance that the space between the two can contain other bound atoms. The discovery, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, raises new questions about the actual definition of an atom. See, it all comes down to what's inside an atom between the nucleus and the nearest electron orbit. Usually, there's nothing. But... Why couldn't there be other particles there too? If the electron orbits the nucleus at a great distance, there's plenty of space in between for other atoms. So there's nothing to stop a giant atom being created and then filled with ordinary atoms. And all these atoms form a weak bond in the process creating a new exotic state of matter at cold temperatures referred to as Rydberg polarons. To create a Rydberg polaron, two very special fields of atomic particles, which can only be studied in extreme conditions, need to be combined. These are a Bose-Einstein condensate, long considered the fifth state of matter, and Rydberg atoms. A Bose-Einstein condensate is an extreme state of matter, 
created by atoms at ultra-cold temperatures close to absolute zero, minus 273 degrees Celsius. Under these extreme conditions, a group of atoms will act and react as if they were all just one giant atom. Rydberg atoms are atoms in which a single electron is lifted to a highly excited state and then orbits the nucleus at a very large distance. The average distance between the electron and its nucleus can be as large as several hundred nanometers, and that's more than a thousand times the radius of a hydrogen atom. Scientists first created a Bose-Einstein condensate using strontium atoms. Lasers were then used to transfer energy to one of these atoms, turning it into a Rydberg atom with a huge atomic radius. The perplexing thing about this atom, the radius of the orbit on which the electron moves around the nucleus, is much larger than the typical distance between two atoms in the condensate. Therefore, the electron is not only orbiting its own atomic nucleus, there are numerous other atoms lying inside its orbit. Now, depending on the radius of the Rydberg atom and the density of the Bose-Einstein condensate, as many as 170 additional strontium atoms may be enclosed by the huge electron orbit. Amazingly, these atoms have hardly any influence on this Rydberg electron's path. The atoms don't carry an electric charge, so they're only exerting a very minimal force on the electron. But the electron still feels the presence of these neutral atoms along the path of its orbit, being slightly scattered by the neutral atoms, but without ever actually leaving its orbit. The quantum physics of slow electrons permits this kind of scattering, which does not transfer the electron into a different state. Computer simulations show that this comparatively weak kind of interaction decreases the total energy in the system, and so a bond between the Rydberg atom and the other atoms inside the electron's orbits created. Mind you, the bond's much weaker than the bond between atoms in a crystal. Therefore, the exotic state of matter now called Rydberg polarons can only be detected at very low temperatures. If the particles were moving any faster, the bond would break. This new weakly bound state of matter will provide scientists with new possibilities for investigating the physics of ultra-cold atoms. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now for another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that the deadly legacy of asbestos is only now reaching its peak. The findings, reported in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, says asbestos-related fatal diseases such as asbestosis, mesothelioma, lung cancer and pulmonary heart disease are only now reaching their peak fatality rates from exposures decades ago. Asbestos is a set of naturally occurring silicate minerals forming thin fibrous crystals that have been used in building materials, insulation and transport. The deadly illness is caused by breathing in the microscopic asbestos fibres which damage and scar delicate lung tissue. Science has known about the deadly effects of asbestos for over a century. However, despite knowing the dangers, industry has continued to mine and use asbestos, concealing its deadly legacy from the public as long as possible. Australia outlawed asbestos in 2003, imposing strict health and safety standards. Canada outlawed its production in 2012. However, Russia, China, Brazil and Kazakhstan still undertake extensive asbestos mining, with China still using asbestos in many products it exports. Police are to deploy drone killers at next month's Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. Queensland State Police say the drone guns will be used to check the use of drone devices at the event. The drone guns are designed to disable errant drones with minimal damage. Police claim trends in nefarious uses of drone technologies has necessitated the use of greater aerial security at high-profile events. A new study claims some 6,000 Australians die from alcohol-related diseases annually, equating to about one death every 90 minutes. The findings, reported in the National Alcohol Indicators Bulletin, documents numbers and trends for alcohol-related deaths and hospitalizations across the country. It shows that an estimated 5,785 Australians aged over 15 died of alcohol-attributable diseases and injury, while hospitalizations attributable to alcohol use exceeded 144,000. A new study has confirmed that taking selfies really does make your nose look bigger than what it is. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association Facial Plastic Surgery, found that photos taken from 30 centimetres away make your nose look about 30% larger. 
Using mathematical models, researchers showed that photos taken up close increased the perceived ratio of the nose width to the face width, and that by stepping back and having your picture taken from around 150 centimetres away, this distortion disappears. So, time to get that selfie stick, or better yet, get a friend to take the picture for you. Divining or dowsing is the widely practiced alleged ability to detect substances in the ground, usually water, using a process involving the supposed movement of loosely held sticks or rods. Despite countless demonstrations, it's never been proven to work when placed under strict scientific testing. Australian skeptics have long been interested in dowsing as it clearly lies within the range of paranormal activities which come into scrutiny. Despite an offer of $100,000 for anyone who can scientifically prove the existence of the paranormal phenomena and multiple tests involving people who genuinely believe that they can divine water, the money is still on the table unclaimed. Aran Segev is president of Australian Skeptics, and he joins us now to provide a skeptic's guide to water divining. The most typical type of dowsing in Australia is dowsing for water, and it's very often done using two thick metal wires called dowsing rods. Each wire is bent into a, the shape of an L, with the short arm of the L held in the hand, and the long arm pointing forward parallel to the ground, and with one wire in each hand, the long arms are initially parallel to each other and parallel to the ground. According to dowsing law, when the dowser comes across a source of underground water, the wires move, eventually crossing each other above the source of the water, or sometimes both pointing in the same direction, presumably to where the water source is. Uh, dowsing is a, the form of pseudoscience that Australians can has most experience with. It's uh, something we've done numerous tests with and we know precisely what's going on. So it's, it's very easy for me to talk about. First, uh, let me talk about what the tests show. It shows, first of all, the dowsers are very good at detecting water when they know where the water is. At the beginning of each test, we always do a calibration run, which is to make sure that the diviners are happy and that everything is in place. So in that run, what we generally do is we have a number of containers, usually six or 10, but sometimes as high as 20, and we fill half of them with water and and we leave a half of them either empty or fill them with something like sand. And when in the first run, we have them exposed and the dowsers simply use the dowsing rods to see whether they can find the ones with water when they can see where the water is and they never fail. The rods react very strongly near where the water jugs are and they always succeed at that stage. X marks the spot. Absolutely. Then we take everybody out of the area. We randomize the location of the water containers completely by chance and then we cover them with some kind of opaque cover, something like a bucket very often. And then we ask the diviners to find or the dowsers to find the water again, this time when they don't know where the water is. And the results are always as expected. The dowsers find the water half of the time, which is exactly what we would expect by chance. And if your listeners want to read about this test and see the graph, they can look in the Skeptic magazine, volume 33, number two, and it's available on the Australian Skeptics website, skeptics.com.au. Now, it's important to note that dowsers are almost invariably shocked by their failure, genuinely shocked. Many have been dowsing water for many years, and it works for them every time. They also succeeded in the open test, so it's really curious to them that they have failed in the blind test. In other words, they are genuine believers and not scam artists of frauds, by and large. I'm not saying there are none, but I have not met a uh, dowser that I felt was lying. Let me tell you what's actually going on. Let's first of all start with what's happening during the tests. We know there is a mechanism called the idiomotor effect. You can test this effect yourself by putting a thread through a ring and holding it at the length of about 20 centimeters, like a pendulum. And then try to leave it stationary, but concentrate with your mind on moving it left and right. Try not to move it with your hand. Just concentrate on the ring moving with your brain. And you will find that even though you don't move your hand, the ring starts moving from right to left. Ah, telekinesis. No? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> telekinesis. That's exactly it. You, you don't consciously try to move your hand, but your hand moves subconsciously. It's not a conscious thing. It's not intentional. You're not trying to defraud anyone. But these dowsers find water in nature. They're in the fields. How does that happen? Well, if you dig deep enough, there's bound to be well, water there. Is that right? Yeah, well, as you said, there's water everywhere. About 30% of Australia sits above very productive aquifers, such as the Great Artesian Basin. In other words, if you drill deep enough, you will find water in Australia. So, in other words, the dowsers could point anywhere, and as long as they don't specify a specific depth, drilling will find water. 
The second one is the Dazer are almost always part of a farming community or farmers themselves. They know the land and I'd be surprised if they haven't developed some instincts based on vegetation, land features, etc. that would tell them where accessible water is close at hand. And that would increase the odds of finding water, finding shallow water, water in a, at a shallow depth. Uh, but most importantly, above these two, there is confirmation bias. Just like psychics, Dazers remember the hits and forget the misses. That's Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 